Thank you. Hello, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining us today and thanks for joining us back after the break. It's always easy to slip off in the afternoon, certainly here in Europe. So we're glad to have you back. Um, so I'll be talking about how to investigate um, outbreaks um, and outbreak origins, essentially. And as many of you um, will know, you all seem to be very familiar with all the details of the case. Uh, in May 2020, the World Health Assembly adopted a resolution that called on the WHO to identify the zoonotic source of the virus and the route of introduction into the human population. So in other words, it called for an investigation into the origins of the COVID-19 pandemic. But it gave no specifics about how this was going to be done. Um, that was negotiated later on uh, between WHO representatives and China, mostly behind closed doors. Um, so in the next few minutes, um, I will walk you through what an investigation into the origins of an outbreak should entail um, when it's unclear whether it resulted from a natural spillover or from research related activities. So here is a diagram where colleagues and I have drawn up a stepwise methodology for a comprehensive, incredible investigation into the origins of an outbreak. Um, I'll take you through, don't be alarmed at uh, all the small writing and the, the number of steps here. I'll take you through um, each uh, and every one of these and we'll be spending the majority of the few minutes that's allotted to me uh, working through this particular slide. So you start at the uh, top left with the first reported cases. So your first step in an investigation is, is based on traditional epidemiology, asking who is being infected with what virus or bacteria, um, when did the infection occur, um, and in what location. And you do this by obtaining case histories, uh, by interviewing patients, uh, carers, next of kin, doctors, nurses, and so on. Uh, you also do this by contact tracing, by reviewing medical records, uh, by uh, consulting newspapers, uh, the gray liter literature, all those things that uh, Virginie told us about. Uh, part of this process is also looking for potential indicators of unusual sources. So for instance, is the virus unusual for the location? Or is it unusual for the time of year? Is it affecting unusual populations in unusual ways? Are there labs nearby working with any relevant viruses? So next, um, you should work out how the infection occurred and the particular circumstances enabling um, infection. And this is the um, analytical epidemiology. Bit. So here you should look for potential indicators of possible spillover of the virus from its natural reservoirs uh, to humans. And Lena told us a little bit uh, about this already in terms of SARS-CoV-2. So have, for instance, the sorts of questions you should be asking yourself at this point in the investigation is, have, for instance, any of the cases being in contact with any known animal, animal reservoirs? Um, exposed perhaps through wildlife trade, uh, through habitat invasion, um, industrial farming, or, or even just be through being miners or villagers uh, living close to, for example, bat caves. Um, or a different approach is could the virus um, have expanded into human populations because of overgrowth of the animal reservoir? or maybe overgrowth of a vector like population like ticks or fleas? Or are climate shifts bringing animal and pop human populations closer together? So you should also look at the genome of the virus for indicators of how it has spread. Mutations that occur routinely as a virus replicates, for instance, can be used to build up maps of the outbreak in both space and time um, and we are now all experts on this, having um, listened to Sudhir's wonderful uh, elaboration of these pathways, et cetera. And here you should be asking um, whether the virus has mutations that are consistent with known patterns of natural 
emergence or if there are unusual patterns uh, emerging. And if there are, if there are unusual patterns or questions that remain, it suggests that alternate origin hypothesis, for instance, a lab um, accident should also be explored. Now, analytical epidemiology is based on sampling um, the virus. Uh, you should also collect and analyze additional animal, human, or environmental samples to try to close information gaps uh, in your origin hypothesis. So um, you may, for instance, collect uh, animal or environmental samples at the suspected animal-human interface. Um, and this could be at a market, it could be at a farm, it could be at an abattoir, it could simply be in the wild. There are a number of possibilities uh, of where this animal-human uh, interface um, could be or that you'd want to sample. Uh, or you may collect human samples. And again, we've also heard about this earlier. So these may be ones that have been uh, collected and banked uh, before the outbreak. There was a question on this earlier in the chat. Or, or there may be samples that could potentially indicate exposure or infection in so-called sentinel populations at the animal-human uh, interface. Now, if a natural source is not identified, or if early evidence indicates a potential lab or research-related research source, the search for a natural source should continue, of course, but the investigation should expand to include lab sources. So this is the first of the green boxes uh, at the top right of the diagram. Here, the initial step is to perform a risk assessment of nearby labs to identify first their purpose, uh, then what viruses or bacteria or what unknown samples or suspect samples are being worked on within these um, labs. Third, uh, what techniques are being used for that work and what sorts of risks that entails. Um, and finally, you want to identify at what biosafety level uh, the work is being done. Now to do all this, uh, you will need access to all kinds of records um, and the more the better. Uh, and it should be in the lab's interest to share this because it gives them an opportunity to demonstrate that they operate safely, securely, and responsibly. So the sorts of records um, you'd be interested in are records of lab virus collections and the samples that they hold. Uh, you would also be interested in records or notebooks of the experiments that are carried out and of any field work that has been done or is currently going on. You would also want access to lab safety records. So these include things like the standard operating procedures at different labs and during field work. Um, they also include risk assessments of individual experiments, incident reports, training records, waste management logs, facility maintenance records, and so on. So these various factors, the, the lab's purpose, um, its viruses, its activities, its biosafety conditions, determine the potential risk to surrounding communities that a lab accident or a safety lapse may spark an outbreak. And this could result from any number of causes, such as a lab staff getting infected, uh, waste not being properly uh, incinerated or decontaminated, uh, aerosols being inadvertently released, and so on. Um, there are lots of possibilities. The point is that if there are indications that um, you know, relevant species or samples are present, um, that high risk activities are being performed, and that safe uh, working conditions are either lacking or uncertain, then the next step is to perform a comprehensive on site assessment. Now, the sorts of activities the on site assessment would entail are listed here. There are obviously way too many uh, to go through, but it gives you um, an idea. Um, and you also see the sorts of uh, things that it involves. Uh, again, lots of documentary analysis, but also physical inspection, uh, observation of practices, um, interviews, um, sampling, all these uh, sorts of things. Now, if done properly, these activities should maximize the likelihood of a conclusive determination of the outbreak's origin. But if the results uh, remain inconclusive, um, field sample collection and analysis activities 
should continue until uh, a source is confirmed, as you will see there on the diagram. Now, if you want more details on the different steps, look, to, um, look up this guide that we've developed. It's readily available online. Um, it also contains lots of um, real life examples of things that have happened in the past, different kinds of accidents, different kinds of natural outbreaks, um, et cetera, to provide some illustrative context to all of that. So I think to most people that all sounds pretty logical, pretty straightforward, pretty, uh, pretty plain sailing. Um, and that is in theory how uh, the pandemic should have been investigated. What we got in the end from the, the joint WH, uh, WHO China joint study was very different to a scientific and forensic investigation uh, like I've outlined here. The joint team did not have the mandate uh, the independence or the terms of reference um, uh, or the necessary accesses to carry out a full and unrestricted investigation into the origins of the pandemic. Nor did it focus um, at all on the potential research related origin. So the big question is then where does this uh, leave us now? Well, possible steps would have been to revise the existing terms of reference of the joint WHO China study, or to pass a new World Health Assembly resolution mandating a comprehensive and credible investigation. Neither of these have come to pass, as I'm sure you're all painfully aware. Um, an alternative would be to establish a parallel international investigation. So getting to a credible international investigation in practice is well nigh politically impossible at this point. Um, if the group of contributing states or associations and institutions is too small, the investigation simply won't have any legitimacy internationally. But even if a parallel international investigation could get off the ground at this point, it's far from certain whether it would come to any conclusive findings particularly in light of the time that's passed and without on-site access to China, which seems to be uh, the case currently. So let me conclude. Um, as it stands, a comprehensive and credible international investigation doesn't seem politically feasible. But, and this is a big but, do we actually need an investigation? Isn't the key takeaway from the pandemic origins debate that while we don't know how the virus first spilled over, it could have been either a natural spillover or a spillover resulting from research related activities. So in order to better prepare for pandemics in the future, we are in any case going to have to address both of these possibilities. We will need to continue surveillance of potential natural spillovers and to develop zoonotic risk assessment tools. Uh, we need to promote behavioral change in high risk populations. We need to fund research into universal vaccines. And we also need to address lab biosafety and biosecurity. Now, I think that argument is right in theory. In theory, it doesn't actually matter what the origin was because we should be preparing for both instances in the future. In practice, on the other hand, I think it matters a great deal. If it turned out to be a lab leak or an accident in the course of regular scientific research in the field, for instance, the scientific community would have a very different reaction than if it was a natural spillover. It would bring home the message about the importance of biosafety and biosecurity and responsible research and of the broader societal responsibility of scientists in carrying out inclusive risk assessments of their work in a much stronger way. I think it would also impact the wider public differently. If it turned out to be a lab leak, it would be a forceful instigator or amplifier of bigger societal debates that need to be had about the sorts of risks that we're willing to take in the name of research. Does the majority of stakeholders, and stakeholders are not just scientists here, feel that lab manipulations of potentially pandemic pathogens is justified? 
Do the benefits of virus hunting outweigh the risks? Can we even do adequate risk benefit assessments when both risks and benefits are uncertain? So these are some of the bigger questions um, that I think are coming out of the pandemic origin discussion and that need some serious engagement. Um, at this point, I just want to give a big shout out to um, my uh, collaborators on this um, guide to outbreak uh, investigations, uh, Rich Pilch, um, Miles Pomper and, and Jill Lester. And um, I think I'm going to leave it there. Thank you for attention and I'll hand uh, back to you, uh, Jose. Thanks everyone.